Or All right, let's get it, let's get it, let's go. Welcome to Black Music History, The Importance of Black Music. I'm sorry, uh, rah, scratch, bring it back. They're gonna edit that one, right? All right, come back to the top. All right, let's get it, let's get it, let's go. Welcome to Black Music History, The Importance of Black History and Music, Exploring Different Genres and How They Are Intertwined. I am your girl, Taye. I will be the host of the day. If you don't know much about me, we can get to know one another right now. I am a guitarist and an MC. I have been playing guitar uh, ever since I was 12. Uh, started rapping in um, high school. Um, really, I use hip hop as a way to really express myself. I use all uh, the music that I do as a way to express myself. But um, I feel like as a woman, um, as a woman that grew up in the 90s, as a 90s kid, um, early 2000s teen, I felt that nine, uh, that 90 percent of uh, expression for me was easier through rap. I felt like any aggression that I wanted to get out, any um, anger or anything like I just want any bravado I felt like I needed to deliver was better for me through rap. And I felt like when I played my guitar, I felt like that was something that was uh, to really just demonstrate my uh, diversity and show that I was capable of something more than what the average Black woman was expected to be capable of. Um, you know, I, I'll walk around with my guitar to this day and people ask me, can you play that thing? No, nah, it's for decoration. No, I'm just playing. But um, <laughs> I have uh, a Master of Entertainment, um, sorry, a Master of Science and Entertainment Business from Full Sail and an undergrad uh, BFA in Media Production. And um, yeah, I use those degrees to further my ability to reach my audience and people who want to be creatives. Oh, shouts out Brooklanda, Brooklanda Entertainment. That's my my thing. Shouts out to the set, gotta rep the set. The Tulips Band, Guitar Gabby and the Tulips Band is something that is all encompassing so many things in one. You have a self-management firm, consulting group, and an international touring collective. We are a gang, gang, gang. There are many gang members across the set, not gang members, <laughs> but set, women in the set that rep the set all across the world, uh, representing for uh, women of color, non-binary um, individuals who just wanna rock. Um, the mission is to inspire diverse rock stars worldwide to challenge the boundaries set in various industries. We do this by providing direct access to music business and legal education to marginalized groups. And shouts out to the leader of the gang, 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 Guitar Gabby. All righty, Gabriella Guitar Gabby Logan is an Atlanta native and proud graduate of Spellman that she is and Vermont Law School. Her background in environmental music and law fueled her desire to start and manage the international touring collective, the Tulips Band. Gabby has provided many opportunities for people like myself and numerous others to come. Um, really, she believes in important. She believes it's important for artists to be well-rounded and well-versed in many areas of the music business, and she inspires women and musicians across the world to be an unstoppable force. And that's a fact, not an opinion. I. Uh, she is currently a writer for Guitar World Magazine. She shreds magazine, the board chair of Girls Rock Asheville, president of Girls Rock Camp Alliance Board, a voting member of the Recording Academy, and the diversity editor for Guitar Girl Magazine. Additionally, she is an outreach and talent acquisitions internal consultant for American Conserv I'm sorry, Conservation Experience. You got to run that one back. Got to run that one back. Outreach and Talent Acquisitions Internal Consultant for American Conservation Experience. Y'all got to give it up. That's my sis. All right. Now, moving forward, we are here. We are here today to talk about Black history and music, um, Black history, culture, all of those things. Um, I'm very Black, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> and I have a lot of things to say as far as uh, my um, uh, informed opinions and um what I've learned and what we all know to be true. And that is that black history, black culture, 
um, specifically Black American culture, is responsible for almost all of the music, all of the fashion, all of the things we see today um, that have become popular, that were once considered to be uh, faddish or flash in the pan. Um, and that's nothing new. It's been happening. It's been the vibe. It's been the wave since the first song to ever chart. So get on with the slide here. So Black history is American history, and it very much is. Um, the Minstrel Show, I don't know if you all are considered uh, familiar with the Minstrel Show, but I'm going to hip you to the T. So the Minstrel Show is considered to be the first introduction of music and theatrical entertainment. Basically, the Minstrel Show is when um, non-Black people would dress up in Blackface and sing songs and do dances that they saw enslaved people doing or Black people doing at the time. Um, a lot of those dances and songs were uh, songs that, you know, Black people were doing to entertain themselves. They were not allowed to read or write. So, um, you know, it's not that they were willfully ignorant, you know, or what people would consider to be ignorant, but they just took what they had and made the best of it. And being that there was a lack of television or media of any kind at the time, I guess people saw what they were doing and were very entertained by what they were doing and decided that they wanted to imitate them and thus entertain others by imitating the entertainment. You get it? All right. So Black people's music, style of dress, dance, and dialect were used to entertain while entertainers performed in Blackface, using Black culture as a costume. And this is a fact. The first international hit song was Jim Crow in, nine, I'm sorry, in 1829, a song in which Thomas, uh, Thomas Dartmouth Rice sang in Blackface and imitated African-Americans. Um, this is something that happens today, maybe not so much with Blackface, but you do have entertainer, entertainers who, um, I don't think that it's coming from a vicious place or a hurtful place, but um, you have entertainers that do sometimes adopt Black culture for a little bit, get a little Black scent, you know, get a little, get a little edgy, you know, as they call it, getting edgy. They get a little edgy and, you know, get a little Black haircut, get some Black friends in the video, maybe get some Black producers behind the scenes to write the songs. And, uh, you know, I don't want to call out any artists because uh, I, I, I enjoy, you know, all art and I understand it all for what it is. But to a degree, um, a lot of that is a modern day minstrel show, in my opinion. That's an opinion. <laughs> Anywho, African-American music was birthed from the pain and lack of cultural identity from enslaved people. So you have people that are brought from their native lands. They are alienated from their culture, their language, their customs, and then more aspects or more often than not, it was literally illegal for them to be connected to their culture because that connection to their culture threatened the, uh, the systems that were being in place to keep them enslaved. So you had a lot of African people or, you know, enslaved people at the time that would camouflage what they were doing. They would camouflage the um, the conversations they were having by speaking broken English or by, you know, creating slang and doing things. They didn't want, you know, uh, the people in power, people in positions of power to know what they were doing because that could very well threaten their ability to continue living, <laughs> you know? So um, being stripped of their customs and beliefs helped them uh, help to lead those people down a path of unique creation. You know, um, they say necessity is the mother of invention. So the need to communicate, the need to express themselves, help them create these uh, facets and aspects of the culture. As black people struggle to find a place in society and a society that was never built for them, they created an art that became the tempo of the world. Most, if not all genres of music, evolve from the black experience. The first instance of this being Negro spirituals. In an effort to keep control over the enslaved, black people were not allowed to read or write. Black people used their history of oral tradition to communicate information in a musical format. And as I stated previously, we are still doing that till this day. Um, maybe we'd be able to do more so if it if things weren't so commercialized and people weren't so focused on making money, but 
I find that a lot of underground musicians and people who are, um, you know, not forced to meet a album quota are able to express themselves a lot more and a lot freely. Uh, shouts out to the underground, to the underground rappers and musicians of the world. So, as I stated previously, um, I also kind of want to swerve and take you to um, like bro Brazil, like capoeira is a style of it's a fighting style, but uh, they had to disguise it as dance because if the overseers or the I don't really want to I don't I just keep using the term people in positions of power because I don't want to say masters. It's kind of <laughs> I don't like that, but yeah. So um, yeah um. The people who were in positions of power, if they saw them training to fight, then that could threaten their, um, you know, their, 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 um, their health and safety. So they disguised the fighting style as dancing. Very much um, with American culture, a lot of dances and a lot of songs disguised, um, disguised um, like ways and paths to freedom. One of my favorite songs that I learned in kindergarten, um, it's a song called "Follow the Drinking Gourd." I don't know if you know this. I'm not. I'm not gonna really sing it all the way. I'll sing a little part of it. Don't judge me. I'm not a singer. But they say when the sun goes down and the first quail calls, follow the drinking gourd. For the old man is awaiting for to carry you to freedom. Follow the drinking gourd. I learned that in kindergarten. I've always liked that song. What the drinking gourd is, they're referring to the Big Dipper. But if you're a slave, you don't know that it's the Big Dipper or you're not, you don't know. But you do know that it resembles a drinking gourd, which is the gourd is um, what they use to get water out of um, maybe a pot. I don't know. I'm not, I didn't live back then. But anyway, <laughs> the drinking gourd, you know, it's, basically telling them to follow the North Star and to follow that path to get to the Underground Railroad so that they can get up top. <laughs> so they can get to, you know, freedom, which is which was northbound, if you don't know. And I feel like it's important because I asked a girl one time about the Underground Railroad and she really thought it was a subway. So it's really important that we have this conversation. Underground Railroad was... <laughs> This happened like three years ago. I was talking, yeah, this is, anywho, yes, in case you don't know, the Underground Railroad, just like I was talking about underground rappers a second ago and underground musicians, that doesn't, doesn't mean you were literally underground. It meant that you were under the radar. No one knew they were safe houses and people who uh, were, you know, wanting to help enslave people's reach freedom. And so they would help them uh, get to safety and travel safely off the beaten path, off of, you know, out of the way of being found out by people that were tracking them down to bring them back to slavery, you know? So that's Underground Railroad. And I, like I said, that song is so dope to me because, you know, they're singing this song and the lyrics are literally telling you how to get out, you know? And I find that we have that also in civil rights movement, you know, with Marvin Gaye, um, what's going on. You know, the, the lyrics for songs have always been the things that help us empower ourselves and get to the next, um, the next empowering phrase of phase of life. But music and dance have always been deeply connected. Dances have also have often been the visual expression of the energy that the music brings. As we moved into the 20th century, big brass bands gave way to ragtime and jazz. The term derived from the African-American term to rag, which means to bring life to music by playing offbeat, creating syncopation. Syncopated beats are very native to um, African, Latino, Afro-Latino communities. Um, you know, we have to always say these things because we have to remember that, as I referenced Brazil earlier, more slaves went to Brazil than any other country um, in the world at the time, I believe. Um, you know, a lot of countries, you know, they integrated differently, at, you know, in a post-slavery world. Some focus more on nationalism. So you have like, you know, I find a lot of the Spanish countries, although they might have, um, although they might have a bit of uh, colorism, they don't really focus on race as much. I'm not going to say that 100% because I, you know, I, I'm generalizing in that way. 
but I feel like not so much as they do or did here in the United States or, um, you know, I don't think it was as prominent. But the point that I'm making with that is that, um, you know, a lot of it's 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 easy to not realize that slaves were in Mexico. It's easy to not realize that slaves were in Brazil, that slaves were, you know, in those Latin American countries because they don't really focus on it as much. And you might see a darker skinned Latino, but you don't automatically think, oh, black person or slave descendant because they're speaking Spanish and whatever. But saying that to say, um, you know, Afro Latino culture is very big on, um, you know, drum beats and syncopation and different rhythms. It's heavy, heavily rhythmic. And that's um, also something that was very big in African culture and here in American culture as we moved and started to create jazz and um, ragtime music. Um, I think we kind of underestimate the significance of these previous genres because as we move forward and create new genres, I don't think we understand but some of the people that I have here on this uh, slide, I've got Ma Rainey and I've got Duke Ellington. Ma Rainey was a very powerful jazz singer. Um, her presence was known to um, really stir and shake up any room that she was in. She had a very powerful voice. Duke Ellington, an amazing composer and um, just very pivotal and helping to um, bring new culture and new life to what we know today as jazz music. Alrighty then. Ah, here we are. So the origins of syncopation have been related to the string instrument, the banjo. The banjo, which nowadays most of us, I know myself, when I think of the banjo, I think of, because I'm going to Louisiana with the banjo on my knee. I don't think, <laughs> you know, I think of like somebody with a straw in their mouth, some overalls and I don't think of a black person I know I don't but when I read this I was very very intrigued and I wanted to share it with everyone the banjo was developed by enslaved people and was the core instrument of most music from the colonial era into the early 1900s and for those of you who don't know the body of the banjo just like I spoke of earlier about you know drums being very important the body of the banjo is a head of a drum so it's pretty dope to create something like that out of what you have around you. So from ragtime, as I stated, we go to jazz. Uh, just like ragtime, I said rag to, to rag meant to bring life to it. Jazz not only was a form of music or a form of music, but it really was um, a verb. And the term jazz has its origins deep within the black community to jazz has a variety of meanings and meant to speed up or intensify the music. And it also had a bit of a sexual connotation. Uh, one of my favorite songs is from the movie Chicago and um, Catherine Zeta-Jones character sang it. It was, and all that jazz, like that. Yeah, and all that jazz, you know, you say that. It's a phrase, you know, when you're telling somebody like, yeah, all that, everything that's going on. You say, yeah, all that jazz. Yeah, I think that's a pretty dope phrase. But anywho. Jazz music started in New Orleans and evolved from numerous forms of music, including ragtime, marching bands, and the French, Spanish, and Italian rhythms that were native to New Orleans. This music and dance go hand in hand and are direct expressions of American culture, African-American culture. Um, who I've got on this screen here, uh, my Nana's favorite, Louis Armstrong. My Nana loved Louis Armstrong. So with that being said, I grew up listening to a lot of Louis Armstrong, like more than I care to admit, honestly. <laughs> like uh, my Nana loved Louis Armstrong and like my earliest memories are riding in the car with my Nana and her driving and singing Mac the Knife. <laughs> and you know, all that I think to myself, what a wonderful world. If you don't know those songs, maybe I'll pull a few up and we'll listen. I don't know. Do y'all wanna do that? Probably not. Oh, y'all do? Okay, okay, I might, but you know, we might do that. But yeah, man, I also have uh, Beth, Bessie Smith up here. Um, I actually can't front and say that I've heard a lot of her music. I just know that she's very, very important to um, 
to jazz music. I'm actually trying to look something up about her now. I just wanted to put her picture on the slide because I felt like visuals and uh, uh, representation were very important in that regard. And I wanted us to see her beautiful face. And uh, yeah, yeah, we actually have to pull some of her music up because I can't even front and tell you I know any of her music. But I do know Billie Holiday and I do know Louis Armstrong, but I wanted to give Bessie that representation, you know, let her know we still we still rocking with her 100 years later. But Billie Holiday is a very interesting figure. Um, very dope. Um, actually watched the movie with she and Louis Armstrong. Um, one of my favorite songs is a song called The Blues Are Bruin. And Louis Armstrong plays trumpet on that as she sings. And um, just as it was in the early uh, 20th century or in the early days of motion pictures, our talkies, so to speak, because before we have, which is very important too, I actually didn't put it on a slide, but I do want to share that with you. The very first movie to feature sound in it was a song, was a movie called The Jazz Singer starring Al Jolson. Al Jolson was uh, very, very popular for doing blackface also. Um, and the movie is primarily, um, it's primarily a silent picture, but the moment that he begins to play and sing um, is the first instance of sound in a motion picture. And I found that to be very interesting because just as we've stated, and just as the theme of the day continues, Black history is American history, and Black culture is very pivotal for all forms and facets of entertainment. The fact that someone that was prominent and famous for doing blackface is the first person to give a sound in a movie, it's pretty dope. But anywho, um, just like they did in the early days of, of talkies, um, that's what they call motion pictures with sound. They called them talkies to differentiate initially. But um, they would put the artists in the movies because you didn't have like, you didn't have, you know, we didn't have phones. We didn't have, you know, various uh, aspects of media. So the movies were the places where you'd go to see, you know, the celebrities of the time, you know, motion picture stars were the stars. So if you wanted to break an artist in an international or on an international uh, platform, they'd put them in the movies um, they did that a lot with Elvis in the 50s. Um, they did that a lot with, um, you know, big band, uh, big brass band um, groups and jazz singers, blues singers. That was the thing. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with, you know, Dorothy Dandridge, you know, um, the movie Carmen, Dorothy Dandridge and um, Harry Belafonte. Those are, uh, of course, that's like in the... Like the early 50s, I believe it is, early to mid 50s, maybe even late 40s. But yeah, those types of movies were where they would break, you know, the artists who could sing and act. They really didn't care if you could act too much. It was all about, you know, kind of cross branding. But the movie I'm referring to with, uh, with Billie Holiday and Louis Armstrong was one of those movies. All right. Now, Let's go. Let's take a turn. Let's swerve. Let's swerve. We've got to move forward from jazz. It's not that we're moving forward from jazz, but I like to say that time isn't, we like to think that time is linear, but a year is a circle. Literally life is a circle. I mean, Lion King taught us that, but literally, <laughs> and it moves us all, you know, <laughs> and it's a circle of life. You know what I mean? So as we go through creation, as we continue to create, things evolve and they keep moving. You know, it's cyclical. So we're not moving on from jazz. It's just that we're growing. And so race music was a mix of jazz and ragtime. Uh, race music was also called, I know it's going to sound a little offensive. And I know, you know, we're in 2022, but we also have to keep in mind that we're referring to 1922. We're literally referring to a hundred years ago. So, you know, they were also called coon songs due to the fact that they were recorded by African-Americans. Um, and this genre later became known as, get it, R&B. Isn't that crazy? Would you ever know that if you didn't come here today? Or if you didn't watch this later? You're welcome. Anyway, 
Country music and swing were also a product of this genre, which all eventually gave way to what we know today as rock and roll, baby. All music owes its origins to African-American history and culture. I'm going to keep saying that because it's a, it's a fact at this point. Ooh, here we go. Now, this is really dope to me. I chose these two individuals because despite, sorry, Elvis, I actually dig Elvis, honestly, but we got to keep it a bill. We got to keep it a billy. We got to keep it a stack. We got to keep it three on. Shouts out, Andre. But no, we got to keep it a billy for really and let you know who the real fathers of rock and roll are. Actually, Chuck Berry was the first one to call it rock and roll. Fun fact. And uh, my baby little Richard down here, gotta shout out little Richard, um, was very instrumental in bringing rock and roll to the forefront. Um, I'm gonna read this slide because I, I typed a lot of it and I'm gonna like kind of swerve. But anywho, so the arrival of rock and roll was the pinnacle of black music and black culture's influence on America. Rock and roll wasn't new, but the next evolutionary step in music. The 1950s were an interested pe um, interesting period in America. Now I'm gonna pause here. Now, do you know why the 1950s were an interesting period in America? Like, you gotta think of it. Like right now we're in a post-COVID society, right? So they were in a post-World War, World War II society. So the big thing for them after World War II is you have the baby boom. Just like now, you know, we call them Zoomers. Y'all are Zoomers because of the boomers, right? So we have the baby boomers who are literally growing up in a time of like, it's it's the calm before the storm. It's literally the calm after and before the storm because you have the craziness of the 50, of the 1940s. You know what I mean? Like World War II ends in what, like 1945. And then you have the 50s. Boom, all these kids are here. And black people, we're still doing what we've been doing. We're just trying to get a little more ahead. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just trying to take an inch. And then, you know what I'm saying? Without them taking away a mile, you know? But um, we're just trying to get ahead. And we're just doing what, we, what we've always done, which is create, which is make music, which is be fashionable, which is just be flavor. You know, we're the flavor of the, of the world, you know? So saying that to say... um. It was a time of prosperity in America. It was very calm. They really had no worries in the 50s. That's why you'll hear a lot of people um, say that they wish they could have grown up in the 50s. I mean, you won't hear many black people say that. But <laughs> you hear a lot of like, you know, white men kind of refer to the 50s as the golden era. Um, I don't know if you ever watched that show, Mad Men. It was really all about like, the 50s being the calm before the 60s came and like really, or like the early 60s, late 50s, and just how there were just, things were just very calm and people stayed in their place. Women stayed in their place. Black people stayed in their place. And there was a food chain, there was a pecking order, and that was the golden era for hetero, you know, white men at that time. Sorry, I don't want to be exclusive, but it's kind of like, what what it was um <laughs> this period is unique due to the fact that it was post-world war ii this is also the first decade where television and radio are becoming the norm at this point now for us we can't imagine it it's almost like kids who can't imagine a world without wi-fi or internet like we remember the world i don't can't i don't know if we do i know i do i remember the world without cell phones i remember when you actually had to be somebody to have a cell phone and what I mean by that is like, yo, you had to really, someone had to care if you, if they called you and you weren't home. Cause otherwise, you know, why do you need a phone? Only important people have phones. And, you know, anyway, so saying that to say back in the days, everybody didn't have TV. And then once people did have TV, it became like this thing where it was like, yo, it's this, we have television and we have radio and now we can listen to our music and we can see an artist at the same time now granted these things weren't portable just as i referred to the telephone a moment ago like these are stationary items so you had to be in like a central environment to experience them um but this was the first era where people actually had these things so whereas before you might hear a song from somebody on the phonograph because that was like prior to that you had the phonograph or you had the gramophone uh which is what the grammys are named after now but phonograph 
gramophone, radio. All you had was that sense of hearing. You don't, you didn't have a sense of, you didn't get to combine your senses. It was just that. So when television comes about, you're now combining your sense of hearing and your sense of sight. And you're getting to experience these musicians in not necessarily real time, but for what you would consider to be real time at that time. So uh, racial tension was higher than normal at this point due to Brown versus Board of Education and the end of segregation in public schools. So you have a multitude, you have a multitude of things happening at the moment. You have post-World War II, you have black people kind of taking that inch that I was referring to with ending segregation. And um, you have young white kids who are being more exposed than ever. Before there were pockets, but now it's becoming a mass level, a massive level, because now you're having mass communications as you have television and radio coming together. So you have young white kids who are being more exposed to black culture more than any other previous generation. And this makes the parents uncomfortable, just like with any, you know, older time period, you know, when you see newer things happening, you begin to either you get upset or you go with the wave. I feel like people that keep it moving, ride the wave. I like to ride the wave. Anywho. So these people did not like the wave that was occurring. They didn't like the new wave of their kids being influenced by black people. And this made most of their parents uncomfortable and prompted white artists to take black music and record cover versions of the songs made by black artists. Many white artists gained fame and notoriety for songs that had been made by black artists. Uh, I've got Little Richard. I don't know if you all are familiar with Pat Boone, but Pat Boone took a lot of Little Richard songs and covered them because it made the parents uncomfortable to see a black man, you know, making their daughter scream. That's a big thing, you know, and that's little Richard actually said that he said when he acted more effeminate, he was able to get on a lot more um, shows and do a lot more um, in front of more audiences because they felt less threatened by him. He said when he was more masculine, um, it, it limited his ability to perform more places so that's when he started wearing lipstick and wearing makeup and yeah I'm not making this up he said it himself I've watched several interviews where he's referred to that and how people don't want to give him the credit as being the king of rock and roll but they've given Elvis that credit and Elvis has even himself credited the fact that he grew up around um a lot of black people and um his song Hound Dog was taken from black a black woman um I, I know her name, but as we, as I looked that up, just there are so many songs that were taken from black artists um, and given to white artists. Uh, but a fun fact is um, a lot of the white kids at the time, they would have the cover album with the white person's face on it, but they would use, uh, they would actually have the real, like say he'd have Pat Boone on the cover, but they'd have little Richard actually inside the case, inside the record. Thank you, Big Mama Thornton. Good luck. I knew that one, but I, I didn't want to say the wrong name. Big Mama Thornton is the original singer of Hound Dog. And, um, you know, there's so many, so many um, artists that now we're able to look them up because we have YouTube, because we have, um, you know, we have the Information Superhighway. That's what they called it back in the 90s. The Information Superhighway. Now we've got it everywhere, you know, but um, there was a time where, where it wasn't everywhere. So anywho, back to the lecture at hand. Oh, I guess we're done, done, done. Oh, well, we're not really done, done, done. That's the last slide. But before we wrap it up, before we wrap it up, I want to slide, slide, slide. Um, I'm going to leave this one up here just because if you have any questions, please hit us at Guitar Gabby at Tulips Band. The link tree has all the linky links for anything you might thinky think, you know what I'm saying? But uh, yeah, this is almost the end, but not quite the end because I would be remiss if I did not mention hip hop and rap, you know? So although rock and roll, um, rock and roll was the biggest thing to happen. It was the biggest, uh, it was the biggest boom to occur in the 20th century, in the 20th century uh, uh, initially. But then from rock and roll 
you've got funk from funk and i love blues out i don't know how i love blues out and i love the blues but from rock and roll you've got funk you've got you know funk that evolves and um a lot of the rock and roll records like you know james brown and uh i don't know if you it's like a r&b kind of funk rock mix a lot of those records were taken and the kids of the children of the 60s are uh, of the, no actually the kids of the children of the 50s you know those are the kids who birthed hip hop uh dj cool herc is credited with starting hip hop he threw a party in 1973 in the south bronx uh it's where hip hop was born south bronx new york um if you don't know that's where it was born although it has traveled many other places and has taken on many other shapes and faces the original place that it was made was the South Bronx and it traveled all over New York. But saying that to say those kids, uh, they didn't have money to go to Studio 54. They didn't have money to go to the popping places that were um, that were more upper echelon. So they would throw parties in the park and they throw parties in the park and they find a cool beat break. I've got Run DMC here on my wall. Also got Jimi Hendrix. Also have... Uh, Fleetwood Mac, you can't see those, but those are some of my faves. But saying that to say, they would find a beat break, which is just a loop of those old rock and roll records, literally the old rock and roll records, the old records from the 50s, 60s. They'd find a cool drum loop because those songs back in the days they had, they were rocking. So they'd find a loop and then they'd create a, a scratch, create a new rhythm. And within creating that new rhythm, They'd get an MC and the MC grabs the mic. MC means two things, master of ceremonies. And it also means to move the crowd. And in order to be a master of ceremonies, you have to be able to move the crowd, baby. They go hand in hand. So saying that to say, um, when it comes down to it all, you had the DJ who's creating the beat break. Then you have the MC who grabs the mic and kicks rhymes. And that's how you have hip hop take place. And from there, like I said, it wouldn't, it all evolves. It all evolves. Hip hop was started by black and brown kids in New York and it took shape and it took over the world. And now here we are in 2022 where you have so many different races, so many different cultures, so many different people, you know, using hip hop as a way to express themselves, as a way to uh, make money, as a way to, um, just be creative, but it started with black history and black culture. So that's all I have to say about that as we factory. Factory, I want to throw that out there too. Yeah, we're gonna pivot, pivot, pivot. <laughs> oh, oh, didn't mean to shake the room. Anywho, um, yeah, my rainy, Billy Holiday, Little Richard were also pioneering queer artists. Shouts out very much, very much. And um, so many more, so many more people that weren't able to actually, you know, express themselves at the time, but their art has withstood, uh, has withstood the test of time. And, you know, now we are here and people like us are able to experience it and carry their torch. Because all of these people are long gone, but their art stays amongst us. And we have the pleasure and the benefit of being able to, you know, take that previous knowledge and that previous energy and infuse it into what we're doing and use it as rocket fuel. And like my man Buzz says, we got to go to infinity and beyond, baby. That's what we're doing. So once again, I am your girl, Taye. I always say host, even though maybe I was your teacher. I don't know. I feel like I was your host, though. I'll be your host of the day. Uh, once again, you can find us at Guitar Gabby and the Tulips Band. You can find me at Taye Cochran. It was at the beginning of the slide. I don't know. If you're interested, you can go back. <laughs> uh, anywho, this has been a pleasure and an honor. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much to everyone. Girls Rock Detroit. Thank you so much for the Girls Rock Squad. Thank you so much to Gabby. Thank you so much to everyone, Maggie, Nicole, thank you so much for all that you all have uh, allowed me to do here today. And yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Bye.